one second. Let me just say that uh, we are going to be recording this meeting. So um, we'll make sure that that's done. And um, so welcome to the part two of um, AI, AIP's Assembly of Society Officers. Many of you joined us for part one, where we looked at new constructs for science policy. It was a, it was a very um, well-received uh, discussion. Thank you so much for coming back again. If, if you haven't joined us before, if this is the first um, meeting, then welcome. And we hope you have a, a great time today connecting with us all. So as many of you know, our, our program changes annually. And um, although, however, this year we really wanted to focus on um, some logistical matter that we're all dealing with, and that is um, the future of our meetings as uh, we were disrupted from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, AIP assembled a letter panel to really envision what the future of our meetings will be um, or what they could be in the future, um, especially in the short term, given the next in the next two to five years, there's very few um, societies who've had a chance to step back, take a breath, and really strategize, given the um, mad scramble that uh, we all needed to um, participate in in order to quickly retool our in-person meetings to virtual. So um, that said, we convened a, a panel of experts who work in various areas of the um, meeting value chain to help identify some opportunities and some ideas for societies to, to think about and to um, bring back to their own communities as they're trying to envision their, their future of their own meetings. So we hope you find the report useful just for discussion and uh, well, our primary audience was our member and affiliated societies. Um, however, we do believe that this report is going to be valuable for other scientific associations um, in science and beyond. So anyway, um, before we get started, there's a couple housekeeping items I wanted to share with you. Okay, so um, please mute your microphone unless you're called upon. Um, and have your video on for the breakout rooms if possible. Um, if you could adjust your name box to indicate your full name in society. Uh, to ask a question um, in, a, in a plenary discussion, we ask that you use the raise hand function. And depending on your version of Zoom, um, it will be found under reactions or participants. So the chat won't be monitored for questions, uh, but you can feel free to use it to converse with your colleagues. And uh, closed captioning um, you'll see is turned on. However, if you find that distracting, you can um, always just hide, your, hide the view for yourself by uh, clicking on live transcript. Okay. And so uh, just a couple conducting expectations for this meeting. Um, as society leaders, we'll hold ourselves accountable for exemplary behavior, just as we do at our conferences. So we treat all participants with respect and encourage open communication. We will refrain from inappropriate behavior as listed here. And violations can be reported at aip.ethicspoint.com. So without further ado, I introduce to you Chris McEntee, the chair of our letter panel. Um, she is a colleague that we that most of us know very well um, as former head of the American Geophysical Union, um, and now she's principal of her own consulting firm. So Chris, thank you for all your hard work and leadership over the past few months to guide the effort. I turn it over to you, Chris. Thank you, Liz, and good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of the entire FACETS panel and to have an opportunity to share this report with you, which I know will benefit from your ideas and discussions as well, um, because I think we all viewed this as a living, breathing document that would spur conversation, but uh, others could add ideas and and um, opportunities and challenges and how to overcome them as we move into a, a future of scientific meetings. 
I'm going to go over the agenda briefly, then I want to introduce our panel and thank them publicly in front of all of you, and then we're going to go into the beginning parts of our discussion. So Liz, if you could put the agenda slide up. So our process for today is um, for the first part, uh, and I'm so pleased so many of the FACET panelists were willing to take the time out of their day for a couple hours to be with us and share uh, their hard work with you and participate with you. So after a few introductory remarks, we're gonna spend um, just a few brief minutes with various individuals of the FACET panels giving quick highlights of the report. You've received the full report, so we're not gonna go into in-depth detail, but we're gonna give you a few key points out of each of them and propose the questions we would like to start the conversation with in the breakout rooms. Then we will go into breakout rooms uh, on the sections of the report. Uh, we will have a total of 40 minutes. You will have an option to switch after 20 minutes. Uh, you will be able to choose the breakout group that you want. We will not be reporting back after these breakout groups, so you do not need to uh, appoint a reporter to report out. When we come back into plenary, I'm gonna give a brief introduction and framework to spur thinking about uh, making room for innovation, how to innovate um, for the future of scientific conferences. And then we're gonna go back into breakout discussions um, to hear your ideas on things that you can begin doing or already doing um, in your organizations and your societies to create more innovation for accelerating scientific community and exchange, which is really the essence of what scientific conferences are. We, at, we will ask you in that breakout group to share one key novel idea when we get back into the plenary at noon. Um, and then we will have plenary discussions where we will have open uh, questions and answers and facilitations and discussions. And then we'll close at around 12.25 uh, with a few summary remarks and then we'll adjourn and everyone will be on their way. Uh, don't worry if you didn't write down everything I said about what we're gonna do in each section because Liz is gonna go over the actual uh, instructions for all the breakouts again and everything when we get to each of the two breakout sessions. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you the panelists. Um, Linda Allen, who is the Director of Scientific Meetings at the American Physiological Society. Gabe Filippelli, who's the Editor-in-Chief of GeoHealth, which is an AGU journal. Amadeep Gill, a PhD candidate at the University of Nevada at Reno. Reno. Lauren Kane, Chief Strategy Officer at Morrissey. Uh, Alex Lazencia, CEO of Underline. Kevin Marvel, the Executive Officer at the American Astronomical Society. Jamie Murdick, Managing Vice President of Sales at Moritz Global Events Company. Brian Papa, the Associate Executive Director at the American Meteorological Society. Lily Wang, the Associate Dean for Faculty and Inclusion, College of Engineering at the University of Nebraska. And we have not that we would not be able to to complete this work without the really, really diligent um, and instructive support and many hours that were given to us by Liz Dart Karen, the AIP Chief of Staff, Frank Graff, the Member Society Liaison at AIP, and Mark Wilson, who's the Senior Editor of Physics Today. Thank you all so, so much for your hard work. Now, before we go into the brief intros of each section, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the report. Um, first of all, all these individuals here, except for the AIP staff, they volunteered their time in less than approximately three months to put forward their ideas of, based on their experience and their expertise to date with meetings and conferences and how to increase their value and effectiveness. So these are not recommendations to you. These are ideas for you all to consider and build upon. Uh, and they're not exhaustive. This was really based on our collective experience. It's a collective of what we knew today based on our various backgrounds and experiences. We also took into consideration what we could consider would be feasible for this different scales and resources available to societies of all sizes and all types of configurations. 
These are not research based. We did not conduct research to uh, do a huge scan or an entire scan of everything that's going on in every meeting. Um, but we do include at the appendix of the report some conferences to learn from and some resources to help you with some of the ideas that we put into the report, such as design thinking and things related to diversity, inclusion, and equity. We also limited our time frame to three to five years into the future or two to five years into the future because we wanted these to be feasible and practical uh, based on what we know today. So we weren't imagining a world 10 years from now or 15 years from now where everybody can connect in virtual reality. Um, but we were trying to uh, envision things that were feasible and practical in the next five, two to five years. Um, and I would say that I take away from this that we envision uh, from our ideas four key characteristics for successful scientific conferences in the, in the future, that they will be omni-channel, they will be blended hybrid experiences where somebody in person can benefit from digital technology and somebody remotely can fully participate as if they were in person. They'll be inclusive, diverse, and safe and they will be really focused on reducing their environmental imp, uh, imp, uh, imp, impact um, and imprint on the environment. So with that, we're gonna begin um, the, the introductions to the five main sections of the report. I'm gonna start out on structures and forms of convening. So in this section, first of all, we reinforce uh, the idea and actually the fundamental basis for scientific conferences that they are, they are really the community of science that accelerates um, the, the, the fundamental understanding of the way the world works and the way um, space and, and other uh, exo universes and exoplanets work but they also are uh, where exchange and networking and connections um, occur. We see a future where we're going from um, traditional in-person to virtual with uh, based on an in-person experience to a blended or hybrid future as the structure of, of the future of scientific conferences. We think time and location based on our ideas will become more fluid. That is, you won't necessarily have to uh, be thinking about, you can only engage in the conference content or with those who are conference attendees during the actual physical days and times um, of, the, of the particular conference. We think uh, our ideas talk about incorporating the benefits of both in-person and virtual convening in being agile and adaptive, both in planning um, and designing them, but also in terms of adapting them in real time during the conference uh, time period. Uh, we see a much, uh, an ability to have much more customized approach based on design thinking, journey mapping and audience, audience expectations, and to really get to clarity of goals and objectives for each meeting as the driving starting point um, in designing the conference uh, for that particular goal, for those particular goals and objectives. The questions that we have put together to start your discussions in the breakout group, if you join this breakout group, are what makes a successful blended or hybrid experience and how can a society or how can we or will we build, understand and meet the needs for virtual engagement so that it feels like the person is actually part of the total experience of a scientific conference in the future. I'd like to turn it over now to Brian Papa to talk about the section on the future of science exchange. Great, thanks Chris. <clears throat> Uh, I want to start by highlighting a few key points on how meetings might change to facilitate the science exchange in the future. <clears throat> uh, first, we see the exchange of information expanding beyond the traditional time constrained in person meeting that has or had a defined start and end, and that the meeting content reaches a broader audience through a variety of communication methods. Uh, second, and building on that, uh, there's an increased amount of and more diverse types of interaction between presenters and attendees. 
And third, we make these changes in a way that gives equal access and opportunities, regardless of how you choose to attend an event. So in-person, hybrid, or virtual remote forms of attendance. Uh, in terms of making content more broadly accessible, uh, we see meetings shifting to more of an on-demand model for content. And we've all experienced this with media that we consume in our personal lives over the past 10 plus years. Uh, we now all kind of watch, listen, read content when we want and how we want on a variety of platforms. Uh, for meetings, this means making recorded content uh, and that can be poster presentations, oral presentations and other types of content available before the traditional meeting period and continuing to keep those available uh, potentially in perpetuity after the meeting period, um, ideally with the ability to comment and ask questions. Um, and what we achieve by this is a shifting of the focus of the actual meeting to be on collaboration, discussion, idea sharing, and network, uh, which we know are all called kind of key components to the uh, traditional meeting. Uh, a couple other approaches that are highlighted here uh, in terms of presenting content and reaching a broader audience include speed talks to promote presentations. Uh, so the idea here is these are very short talks up to one or two minutes that act as an overview of the topic to give attendees a quick uh, sense of what the content of the topic is. Uh, and they could be used to facilitate attendees making schedules or determine where to focus their time, especially if we're uh, presenting them with a large amount of pre-recorded uh, content ahead of the actual meeting. Uh, also interviews and panel discussions uh, so that there's uh, more uh, multi-channel communication. I think all of us are kind of general, generally familiar with these approaches, uh, but a key aspect in the future is giving full access to remote or virtual attendees to partake in that discussion. Uh, and a number of technologies exist now to allow that. Uh, in particular, I think we've all seen uh, the ability to chat among live and remote attendees, uh, but also now video participation um, and interaction uh, so that we're having interaction uh, between remote attendees, live attendees, uh, and also uh, presenters that either are remote or live. Uh, in terms of increasing the quantity and type of interactions, uh, if we shift the purpose of the actual meeting towards increased person-to-person -person, uh, interactions via discussions and networking, uh, uh, we again want to be sure to extend that capability to a variety of attendee types. Um, and what's been somewhat missing is a kind of robust way to replicate that in-person meeting experience for virtual attendees. Uh, where you can interact with a small group of individuals face to face, either in a planned way or that kind of serendipitous uh, meeting of people in, say, a hallway at a meeting. Uh, but just in the last few years, there are new platforms that do a reasonable job of replicating that in a virtual environment. Uh, so if you're not already familiar, I'd really encourage you to look into platforms like Let's Lunch Pool, Gather Town, and a number of other similar platforms that, that have all also offer the same technology. Um, and these allow uh, an individual in a remote setting to navigate a virtual meeting space that can be a replication of the uh, live physical uh, meeting convention center, for example, and communicate with other attendees, virtual or live presenters and exhibitors. Uh, and then two last points. Uh, by recording and storing and making available meeting content for an indefinite period, uh, there's a number of intellectual property and content sharing issues to be aware of, um, and that should be considered before moving forward with those changes. And then last, I just want to mention broadly that the outlines, uh, that the changes outlined here in the future of science exchange, um, and really throughout the report are quite different from how meetings have been run for for a number of decades, maybe even centuries. Um, I've outlined a few approaches here, but I'd encourage everyone to kind of find out what works for your community and volunteers, uh, what they're looking for in a meeting in the future. Um, try to keep a variety of meeting um, methods available that ideally appeal to a broad segment of your community. 
and try experimenting with different approaches, um, ideally at smaller meetings, and then uh, carry those forward into larger um, aspects of your me meetings in the future. And then in terms of the breakout session, a couple of key questions. Uh, if attendees have the freedom to watch sessions when and where they want, how can we ensure um, that we engage them to ensure meaningful scientific exchange, particularly, particularly with the actual presenters? And how can societies create opportunities for researchers to easily meet those with shared interests um, or identify collaborators across the field and research areas? So look forward to discussing those items in more detail in the breakout session. Thanks. And I'll pass it off to Lily. Wayne. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in this section of the report, we discuss how it's imperative that scientific societies and conferences embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and accessibility as fundamental values. So these concepts should not be an afterthought or icing on the cake. They need to be baked into the cake and integral to all of our missions in all of ours scientific society policies and practices. Um, and we talk about diversity, when we talk about diversity, we mean it in the broadest sense possible. So diversity across stakeholder groups and diversity in terms of demographics as well. So we recommend that uh, these the future scientific convenings should design experiences for every stakeholder in the scientific enterprise. And this would include publishers, vendors, like those who are equipment suppliers and manufacturers, interested media, politicians, other advocates. And those persons, those stakeholders should be involved in the conference planning, that they are in the value chain. They're not just treated as bystanders of our meetings, but integrally involved in the planning. Of course, we should also include diversity in terms of um, demographic diversity. So members of underrepresented minoritized groups, those at different career levels, these should be these persons should be consciously involved um, and not just including those that have had a history of active involvement, but consciously making sure that we're including these um, persons. In terms of tactics, this section discusses many of them and we're just gonna summarize them in three bullets. Um, widening access. That's already happening when we've had to move to virtual um, formats in this past year, but we should continue doing that because that has been a great benefit that we've heard from a lot of our member members. So widening them through, through virtual components, closed captioning, thinking about how we can make sure that public lectures could be made available to the general public, those in the local community. Then thinking about diverse representation on plenaries, keynote speakers, discussion panel members. Another tactic is making sure that we're tailoring program options to all of the persons who might come to our meeting across different interests, different needs, career levels. Something that I certainly believe in is that we should be considering having professional development sessions for uh, attendees that cover diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, access topics. So how to minimize implicit bias and how to be an active bystander and ally to, um, to underrepresented groups. All also embedded in here is we need clear codes of conduct and anti-harassment policies that are enforced and so that is discussed in this section. And there's many other ideas and possibilities. And we really hope that this, um, this part will stimulate your societies to consider and increase accessibility and audience reach. So in the breakout room, um, Amandeep Gill and I will be leading this or facilitating the discussion uh, focused around these two questions. So how can your society continuously evolve its culture to better embrace all participants? And what are some tactics for expanding volunteers from these diverse stakeholder groups in conference planning so that we create space for these diverse viewpoints and ideas to take root? Moving on now to Lauren. Thank you, Lily. Uh, so uh, very pleased to be here with you all today. Um, and the, uh, the conference partnership section looks at opportunities for societies to engage with all types of partners, sponsors, exhibitors, universities, and other societies uh, to both create a better conference experience and of course one that is also more financially sustainable. 
So in, in this group, we reflected on the fact that while collaboration is so core to uh, most societies in so many areas, conferences historically have been solo endeavors due to competition concerns. So we explored what different types of partnerships might look like across different stakeholder groups, including partnering with other societies, um, not just for joint conferences, but also perhaps just joint aspects of conferences like exhibitions, career fairs, poster galleries, whether in person or virtual. And such joint approaches offer shared benefits and liabilities, including economies of scale, but perhaps one of the more compelling benefits is the information sharing and best practices that can come from working together with other groups. This was certainly, I think, a highlight of 2020 in society sharing what had worked and what hadn't in a pivot to virtual. And we hope that this will continue in a hybrid or in-person environment in the future. We also talked about ways to integrate corporate sponsors and vendors and institutions beyond the booth learning the objectives and making them thought partners in potential new models and real participants in the meeting as a whole and not just being rele relegated to an exhibition. And in the case of academic partnerships, we encouraged strategic connections with universities who might provide physical space and technological resources for smaller societies, as well as special ways to connect with students and researchers at those institutions to enhance the meeting. And last, uh, but very critically, uh, we explored the importance of partnerships with identity-based organizations to further DEIBA goals and ensure that conferences are not just diverse, but are inclusive and offer a sense of belonging, irrespective of their format. And in terms of the breakout discussion, uh, we will be focused on uh, two questions. The first, beyond a fully joint conference, what can joint career fairs, exhibits, poster sessions, and other joint components look like, and how could they work? And then second, how can societies better engage with exhibitors and sponsors with on-site, virtual, and blended formats? So look forward to uh, having that discussion with many of you. And next up, we have Kevin. Hi, everybody. The uh, clipper ship of uh, great new ideas for conferences, we want to make sure it stays sailing on the high seas and not run aground on the reef of financial reality. Uh, and so this section was focused on how do we make sure that we can sustain and grow uh, our conferences uh, from a financial basis, from a sustainable business model. Um, Conferences we found can be uh, financially successful if they're managed and planned for correctly. And one of the challenges we all face is that we sign contracts uh, several years in advance for in-person meetings. And those have to take into account uh, the new hybrid model that we think will become a reality and how you adjust to that. And then meetings beyond that will have to completely factor in the, the issue that you probably are gonna have slightly less people in, in person, but you're gonna to have to factor in the costs of having a hybrid model. Um, partnerships are gonna be available. Imagine a world where uh, instead of trying to arrange for two organizations to have meetings together at the exact same time, you just share content back and forth about from meetings that took place at different times and that everybody could leverage from that. Um, content that is shared and produced at meetings is gonna become ever more modular and therefore saleable uh, in modular pieces. So that's something to think about. Um, also, meetings will now be able to be archived. We're recording our session today. People are gonna be able to see it later. And the same thing can happen with scientific content, professional development, and other uh, content that we might have at future meetings. Um, the uh, was just mentioned professional development and other uh, development of soft skills at conferences. Instead of focusing strictly on the science and the research that our members uh, want to present at their meetings, uh, we have the opportunity to expand and enhance uh, the service that our organizations provide to our professionals by giving them new opportunities that we, uh, in new ways. Um, some of us have done so at our conferences in the past, but not nearly to the level that we can probably deliver now. So going on to the breakout questions, um, we're uh, fundamental to coming up with a sustainable business model is how are you going to charge people? Uh, everybody thinks that everything online is free. I can assure you having signed the checks that uh, 
The online services necessary for hybrid meetings are not free. In some cases, they can be quite expensive. Um, and there's a lot of evolution right now in the pricing space of all of these vendors. Um, for the same kind of tool, you might see a factor of two difference in cost uh, between suppliers. Um, that's something to explore. I think the market is still really dynamic and over time it'll settle down a little bit and, and uh, become less, uh, have less of a range in, in prices. Um, how do we offer modular content? More importantly, how do we make sure that we can sell modular content to the participants in ways that doesn't allow it to suddenly be posted to personal YouTube channels, all that kind of stuff, intellectual property uh, factors in here. And I think very important thing to discuss is what cultural changes uh, have to take place to allow different business models. What do you have to do to ensure that people treat and interact with people who are participating in a virtual meeting virtually uh, or a hybrid meeting virtually uh, interact in the same kind of ways that people do when they're in person. How do you capture the, the um, offline value that meeting attendees derive and make sure that it is shared with those who are participating virtually? So that's the, uh, what we'll talk about in our breakout and I'll hand it back to Liz or Chris, whoever's gonna take it from here. Thank you all so much. Since we have just a few minutes before the breakout begins at 1040, I thought I would just um, open it up for one or two questions or uh, comments that anyone in the, our attendee audience would like to uh, pose or reflect upon. And please raise your hand if you have something. Mike um, Farah from the American Meteorological Society. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question, and this is if anybody either on the panel or uh, perhaps even one of the listeners. Uh, we're getting ready to plan our uh, annual meeting for January. Um, and so last year was all virtual, like everybody else, probably with COVID. We're anticipating a hybrid conference this time, but frankly, we've never done one. So has anyone had any recent experiences? I'm guessing not because we haven't had a full return to work, but um, I'm just looking for if, if uh, anybody's got anything to offer above and beyond what was just discussed on, on the hybrid or uh, it was, I'd be interested to hear your experiences. I think we're all gonna be dealing with that over the next six to 12 months. I, I can weigh in on that if, if I can. Um, very few organizations have had an in-person return yet. So there haven't been a lot of examples of hybrid meetings. You can look around and find some. Um, we tried, but they're not, they're not a lot taking place yet. I think one key thing to think about is that um, the best way to have a successful hybrid meeting now is to not try and make the uh, conference completely integrated from a hybrid perspective. In other words, one way to help you ensure success and decrease the complexity is to focus on providing the most valuable content, the most uh, interesting content, the plenaries, maybe presentations from government representatives, whatever is important to your community and provide that content in a hybrid mode and allow for interaction and discussion and networking around that content instead of trying to make every single parallel session uh, fully integrated and available. That's gonna be highly expensive, rife with risk and um, may not even deliver value at the end of the day, equivalent to just the highest, highest quality um, sessions that you typically have at your conference. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I, we were thinking similar. I, we, we can't afford to do even, you know, the parallel part of it. If you did every single, we have like, it's sometimes 20 to 30 parallel sessions and it'd be cost prohibitive to try that. So yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely, we have one thing we did for the, uh, the one we, we just had last year, which was the survey afterwards to see what people found most valuable in the, um, in the uh, virtual mode. And maybe we can data mine that to figure out what people like the most and try to offer those few things do we have i would actually suggest that we maybe share that between societies if we have any similar feedback i'd be interested to hear what some of the rest of you had interesting uh, feedback from your members on uh, what they found worked well in a virtual setting versus what they didn't like right? so i would you know hopefully we can find a way to share that kind of thing because we do have a document i'd be happy to share with the rest of you thanks Thank you mike Angela, we'll take your question and then I'll turn it over to Liz to uh, give us our instructions for the breakouts. 
All right, thanks, Chris. Angela Kaiser, AAPM's Executive Director. One thing I'd caution the group, I don't have an answer, but I'm a little concerned about the use of the word hybrid meeting and the expectation that that sets uh, about experience. So I just think we need to keep that in mind. Um, you know, what do we expect the experience for, for a remote participant to look like versus someone that's there face to face? and how to best describe it. I, I was involved in a, another uh, round table with other executive directors and a colleague raised that and I thought it was interesting. So something to think about as we're discussing today. Thank you, Angela. And I, I think that's why you saw our idea about trying to think through design thinking from an attendee's perspective, no matter what form they're taking in their attendance. Um, and really starting with that in planning the meeting, um, which flips a little bit the model where we get our sessions and then we plan how we're going to organize the time and the interaction. Um, so that, that's one idea that we would throw out for that. Liz, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce the breakout session. Thanks, Chris. So, um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate um, that you will have the chance to choose which breakout session you want to join based on what you heard from the panelists today. So um, there will be five um, and we will open them shortly and you will be prompted to pick a room to go to, okay? So it is a 40 minute session, but midway through we're going to to send a prompt to everyone that if you wanna to switch to be part of a different discussion, and um, here's some um, topic, other, other topic conversation, you can do that. And you can do that by going to the bottom of your screen and clicking on breakout rooms, not the leave meeting button, <laughs> the breakout room button, and you can actually choose a different room. So note that if everyone decides to converge on one breakout room <laughs> or we have a lot of people in one room, what we'll do is we'll um, be able to tell this fairly quickly and we'll break the room in half. Um, and um, we'll ask for people to, certain amount of people to come to the other room. So, um, so let's see, uh, we will not report back to the group afterwards. Just a, a heads up so you do not re need to report um, back. However, we ask that we remind the panelists if you could remember to click the record button because we would like to record the conversations in the breakout rooms. Okay. Great. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, one last thing. At the, at the end, um, when we're ready to come back to the main room, you will get a 60 second notice that the room will be closing. And if you leave the meeting by accident, don't worry about it, just um, rejoin and we'll let you in. Welcome back everybody. I hope you all had as productive and um, engaging conversation as we had in our breakout room. In fact, I think at least for breakout one and maybe for the other ones, we need to apologize because we brought people back as someone was in mid-sentence uh, sharing ideas. Um, so um, hopefully we can find a way to continue to connect all of you even after this session. I'm sure AIP can help us with that. Uh, we're going to go into our next session, which will be just a little bit of um, further thought stimulation before we go into the next set of breakouts. Um, and this one is entitled uh, Breaking from Traditional Planning Approaches. Uh, and, the, and really, uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about some success factors to help break in into the way we've always planned in the past. Um, and really, this is just kind of a thought stimulation section because the, the main context is going to come from all of you in the breakout sessions. But one of the things that we uh, noted in our discussions was that many organizations do not have a strategy for their meeting portfolios or conferences overall. 
and for each individual meeting and how it fits into that strategy. So that's something we would encourage um, everyone to think about how you might go about doing that. Now I wanna tell you a little bit of a attendee story since we talked about storytelling um, about someone who um, had a really fabulous experience at a meeting. Do you remember, this is a letter to this individual's, the president of this individual's member society. Dear member society president, I want to commend you and your colleagues on the engaging experience of the recent conference that I attended. I was overwhelmed in thinking about how I could possibly find others who share my interest and attend sessions that I was most interested in. I am also extremely introverted and need to take breaks, even when I'm in in-person meetings. And I'm a petite woman who has experienced inappropriate behavior in my lab. You made that easy for me from the time registration closed and even before I came on site. To my pleasant surprise, the day after registration closed, I received a text with a link to a digital roadmap for navigating the meeting. It included a list of all attendees, speakers, and participants um, who, because it was so well tagged with keywords, not just from our abstracts and talk titles, but also registration um, information, such as my place of employment, university, my background and interests, that I could opt into or not, depending on how much information I wanted to share. I easily search for what I'm interested in and who am I would like to meet. In addition, we used our ORCID IDs for all registration, which really helped because everyone knew that I was the Jane Williams from uh, Arlington College, not the Jane P. Williams at MIT or Stanford who were also attending, but work in completely different fields of study. I contacted individuals ahead of the meeting to exchange information and have arranged a variety of meeting times and locations, both in person and remote. There is an easily used, uh, use, there's an easy to use interface similar to using OpenTable to schedule restaurant reservations. If an attendee chooses to, when they register, they can include a video in, or written or audio introduction about themselves, their works and recent publications with links for accessing their research output. I am so pleased with this because one of the experts in my field has provided such a syllabus that I can now use with my students. I was also able to contact her ahead of the meeting and she has also agreed to a, for a particular time and place during the meeting where she will review the syllabus with a remote uh, group of my students and my colleagues who are not able to attend the meeting. There are also content modules that I can access and I was more than willing to pay a small fee for all of these. For example, my society has created a packet of information in my field that includes archived webinars and abstracts from earlier in the year, along with a few journal articles and a tutorial on publishing with a journal editor. The meeting app is extremely well developed. About 10 days prior to getting on the plane, I downloaded the app and began scheduling my time both on set and for accessing content that I will miss either while on site or post the family wedding that I must attend because I had to leave the meeting early. It's functionality on, the on my laptop or my, on my iPad and my cell phone allows me to stream pre-recorded presentations and archive sessions back at my lab for my students. I can use these to arrange times to talk to them even after sessions I attend on site. When I check in at the hotel, the TV in my room is preloaded with the meeting app so I can access my personalized event schedule and the entire schedule and the attendees list on the TV or video audio connected to a smart speaker. I click check-in and receive all event tickets as QR codes automatically loaded into my cell phone so there is no need to visit a registration desk. If I need to come back to my room during a session, I can use the TV app to watch or listen to the session from my room. If I have questions, I can post them in a chat box and receive answers from volunteers in real time who have received free registration to the meeting in exchange for providing this assistance. I can also use this function if I feel unsafe at any time during the meeting. Also, when I arrived at the hotel, I clicked over to the meeting Slack in addition to the app to see if the conversation was, what conversation was already occurring. The chatter referenced a person from the last meeting that I hadn't seen, so I clicked over to that page and was easily able to pay, purchase a la carte access to that person's presentation. 
Soon, an alert on my phone reminds me that I've arranged coffee with attendees I have met virtually with a map function. With a map function, I apologize for that. I am in uh, my sister-in-law's house and I have no idea how to turn everything off. So my apologies. Uh, soon an alert on my phone reminds me that I've arranged coffee with attendees I've met virtually with a map function so I can easily navigate the Metro stops to get there. We met and then we receive another text alert reminder that it's time for each of us to attend our first scheduled session. When I enter the meeting room, I am amazed. I was amazed. On the large video screen, attendees are already engaging in a virtual chat with those on site and those remote. They are also beginning to raise questions and topics to discuss with the presenters as the presenter content has been, content has been pre recorded. The convener has had facilitation training and is arranging the topics in small groups for discussions with the individual presenter for that particular topic. I wonder how my small society can afford such a digital infrastructure and I find out that you have partnered with 10 other smaller societies and developed a group purchasing program for a common digital infrastructure. I have now renewed my membership for at least five years in a row and I plan to recommend membership in your society to all my colleagues because of the ability I have had to engage while on site and remotely and the added benefit to my students and my colleagues who could not attend with me. So there's a couple of key things that um, could be success stories uh, or success factors in this kind of uh, experience. And one is thinking and design thinking, using design thinking, thinking through the attendee experience from the time they actually register registration is closed till they arrive on site and how to make it easier and easier for them to participate, but also connect, network and access the content and, and information um, that they're looking for, for what would particularly meet their needs. This was clearly something where they had thought through some blended experience because this individual was able to participate um, easily on site, but also remotely back home with colleagues who were unable to attend, even while this individual was attending on site. There is an ability for continuous exchange through the use of Slack, the, the app, um, and um, other video and digital support for the person. There is added value through content, content packages of content and other uh, archived information that they could use for themselves personally, but also for their teaching. There was real-time assistance through a chat box. So the individual didn't have to wait to get answers while someone might've been answering other emails. And there were cost savings to the society and presumably also to this attendee because the societies had foregone their traditional approach of each person purchasing infrastructure support, digital support, uh, projection support individually and grouping together to make a group purchase for a lower unit cost to all. So I hope that stimulated a little bit of your thinking uh, for the next breakout. So we're going to move into the next breakout and here's um, what we would like you to do. Liz, you're going to walk them through the breakout instructions. Yes, that I will. Thank you. Okay, so for this breakout, um, it's more focused about how you can start working with your society to um, put some of the report recommend uh, report ideas um, into action. Um, it's really hard to break the mold from tradition, um, and especially when you have uh, dozens, if not in some large societies, hundreds of volunteers helping to organize. So the breakout discussions will focus on um, two questions. What change do you think your organization will have to make in the next two to five years? What's have to make? Another one is what, what do you want to make in the next two to five years? So the next question will be what what could a meeting strategy for the future look like? What are some guideposts that might be helpful for organizers to which they can refer when experimenting or trying new things? 
this is a point that we've made, um, the panelists made uh, in their, in the facets report itself, is that when you're, when you're approaching this and you understand that you're going to need to experiment and you have hundreds of people working for you, um, it, it's, um, it might be very helpful to have a, a defined meeting strategy to help um, uh, set the guideposts per se, um, to um, allow people to understand um, that which you're going to focus on. What are your objectives? And so it allows people to experiment uh, creatively, but not, you know, no holds barred. <laughs> and you're, you're all sort of dancing to the beat of the, uh, of the same drum. So these are the two questions for our breakout room. Um, and this one, this is gonna be a very different um, paradigm from the last one. Um, we'll, you'll be assigned to a breakout room randomly. And we'll be all in that, we'll, we'll stay in the breakout room for the full duration. It's only a 25 minute uh, breakout room. And then we'll all come back and uh, have a plenary open discussion. And so um, all rooms will dis we'll discuss these same questions and we will um, post that, we'll try to post them to the chat. I'm just talking to myself right now, remembering that we should be doing that. Um, and then the, um, the breakout rooms will be asked to share one novel insight that they've gleaned from the discussion. Something that you haven't heard before or that you really feel is important to, to share back with the, with the group. And um, after that, we'll have um, more of a, a, a back and forth and a dialogue where you can continue to ask questions of the panelists about the report if you like. Okay. So a uh, question to Frank, are we ready to open the rooms? We are ready. Everyone will be uh, sent to their rooms automatically. If you have any issues, just come to the main room and I will help you out. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome back everyone. Um, I think all of us are experiencing in real time what it's like to be in a, in a virtual meeting when, when you have breakouts or discussion times and you have set times, but there's still discussion to have and now we don't have a place to, or a way to perhaps connect, <laughs> even post this meeting to be able to continue those conversations. And so we're experimenting ourselves here on how to even do this kind of assembly two and a half hour meeting well, uh, but we're back now into open plenary. And so this is an opportunity for, um, for all of you to engage in conversation among each other as well as, as well as we can in a group of nearly 90 people. Uh, but I just wanna start with and seeing from each breakout group if there's one idea that you heard that you had hadn't heard before, something new and novel that you think might be applicable for all to be able to, to benefit from. And if you could use the raise the hand function, that would be very helpful. Michael Maloney, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it started. Um, oh, yeah, I think I'm okay. All right, I'll get it started, Chris. Thanks again. And we had a great conversation. We touched on so many different points. Um, hard to choose one. I'll just make, a, so I'll make a couple of really quick comments, which is when thinking about a meeting strategy, I was struck about just the sheer complexity of it because there are so many subgroups of stakeholders within any one society. And it's just like a, a strategic plan for the whole organization or coming up with a business plan, you have to engage in it with quite a lot of different uh, stakeholders. We had lots of discussions around surveying before and after, and when we come back to having in-person meetings, finding out what people missed about virtual meetings. And then also there was a really interesting conversation around on the diversity side around leveling I, is the way I would say it was that particularly younger early career members of the community found the virtual experience to be leveling and they were able to interact with senior members of the community in ways that they might not have been able to at a real meeting where they might have been afraid to stand up at the microphone or tap on somebody's shoulder the 
in the in the coffee queue and that, and that was something i hadn't heard before that element of sort of inclusion and i thought that was interesting i thought i would share thank you michael diane um okay uh we had a lot of discussion that went around uh what's going the in the up and coming in person plus hybrid uh combination for meetings uh, finding the right balance uh, what is the added value of, to an individual for having uh, both of those components? Maybe they're not going to be simultaneous. We could have in-person uh, for a few days and then uh, longer term asynchronous, virtual, et cetera. Uh, probably the most interesting thing that I heard was um, this means that many of us are building up libraries of videos, recorded information, um, maybe they're being systematically put in a database and maybe they're not, but this content could be available to be monetized. So, for example, the suggestion was that uh, you would have a video and then perhaps an associated quiz with that video and you could sell that to uh, for uh, some kind of educational purposes. Uh, this is being uh, done um, by, I think, APS. Uh, there was a a lot of interest again with uh, what to do with this. Well, how about making it uh, available as podcasts, podcasts specifically about physics or the particular societies. Um, and all of this helps us reach a very broad audience. Thank you. Other ideas or thoughts, or if there aren't those to share from your breakout group, um, questions that you'd like to pose to your colleagues here? Uh, Mahesh, you're on. Yeah, um, I just want to share what we had in our um, breakout room. The second one, which I remember, is about the finances. And uh, uh, this one, being a treasure for my society, my ear pops out about that. What I heard in the session is uh, all of us are struggling. Uh, it's it's a challenge for all of us. And one point which I made it was like in from our APM, even though we are financially doing quite good, however, we are seeing this uh, uh, constraint on all our revenue streams, which is which are like membership, publications, and meetings. And uh, going forward, I think probably we had to uh, wake up to this one and address this by having going more mean and lean. Uh, with our meetings. I think that's one of the take, I, I, I thought like that was the main thing. Everybody is having these challenges. And I think meetings like this, discussing what we learn from each other will really enhance us. To add to Diana's point, APM do have a wealth of our uh, lectures and um, uh, recorded. And we are we used to give it everything free, but now we are looking into um, charging for virtual library access as we go forward. At least hoping that would uh, add a new revenue stream. We do not know how it's going to turn out, but we're going to try it. Thank you for that. It's hard for me to imagine that there aren't other uh, really interesting points to be made among this group of people. Oh, Mike, your hand is up. Yeah, this is just a quick follow-up question to Dr. Mahesh. Um, you mentioned you're talking about charging for library access. Is that going to be separate charge or is that going to be a part of your society's membership? Because this to me could be something that reinforces a value to, to, to having a membership. And some of the younger generation sometimes don't see a value in being a member. So Angela will really, our executive director will laugh. Will, um, uh, what is that? She'll object. I'm no. here. I'm oh, here. Yeah. No. Don't do that. Don't no. do that. Exactly. So until now, we had our, our house open. Means we were giving everything free. Virtual right. library, which we recorded meetings, and it was available because physicists need continuous education credits every year. That's the main attraction. But now with all the streams coming in, and we are also trying out the virtual meeting or the hybrid meeting, we have the board has approved us now an option. We are still working out to charge a minimal price and also incentivize those to attend in-person versus virtual. They will have access to all the meetings, but at a reduced price at a little bit more time delayed. 
So all different aspects have been working out, hoping we will be still able to attract everybody to the meeting. We won't lose the attention. However, those who cannot attend like international candidates can have the access to the science, but about eight or 10 weeks later. And after one year, the entire library will be free, like will be available for a certain cost. So, so we are hoping that we won't upset the uh, membership because we were giving out everything free. Right. But we thought this, when this pandemic hit, this is the right time to introduce this scaling uh, the revenues model because I, we are hoping the members will understand because of all the constraint we are having in the revenues. I think. Angela, if I miss something, please add on to this. I would just tell you when we started our virtual library access in the early 2000s, the intent was not to, for it to always be free. It was to encourage people to participate and you know get them hooked on it and then start charging and that does not work. So just be very careful right. um, how, how your business model for that. There are expenses, it can be a lot and you just need to think about it. Everyone's probably different. So I'm curious if anyone's looking at rather than having the traditional membership model, looking at a model where it's, it's kind of like you're joining society prime and you're paying your, your annual subscription um, for a certain, you know, for access. And then uh, beyond that, then you pay for your premium movie hmm. or, you know, Disney plus, and then saying, let's not have membership fees. Let's have an annual kind of subscription fee. Um, it's interesting to me, Amazon, Netflix, CBS Access, Disney Plus, Hulu, they all call you members. Um, they think about it that way. There's actually a book done on that by a woman named Robbie Baxter. So is anyone thinking about that? Like, let's do away with an annual membership fee and move to something like a subscription model like we've seen in popular, I guess, entertainment, you would call it. I don't know if it's feasible or not, but I'm just curious if anyone's thinking about that. But I'm even curious to see how these uh, streamings will survive or in the next couple of years, because uh, yesterday already Netflix has seen their uh, ranking going down because of the computation. Now they are like, so the Amazon might work out because they have the membership, the millions of membership, but other streaming only services, I'm they're going to have a lot of um, pressure for the revenue stream as we go along. I'm not sure. At least we are not thinking that way. Brian. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll just say um, we've been thinking about it um, in part because, uh, you know, we have this uh, bundle of benefits and services that all members get. They all get the same package, more or less. Um, but we know that some of those benefits and services are really valuable to an early career or a younger audience, while a completely different set of benefits and services is valuable to an older, uh, more established senior uh, type member. Um, so uh, we're just kind of thinking about whether there should be uh, different bundles or you, or you pick your uh, benefits that apply to you as opposed to paying one membership fee, getting all the benefits and services with that one fee, so. Thank you, Brian. Emma Deep? I think picking and choosing would be excellent, especially early career. Um, I would like to be able to, from one month, shift to a different like division of APS, right? And listen to um, whatever content they have and then move on. Also, um, I think maybe it's perhaps not a one-to-one -one ratio or uh, comparison with like Netflix. We have a mon monopoly with APS, with different societies, just there's monopolies on the content because people are gonna flock to these societies. Brian. Okay. Um, I had brought up during the um, um, breakout that um, one of the things that, that that affected us was the ability to do more outreach in terms of education. But I'll share something that we we learned from 
our virtual meeting last year, what we did was we made the uh, meeting free to trainees, to students and postdocs who were members. And we only opened the meeting to members. Um, two things that happened, one of which is that we got a lot more international participation from early career scientists um, than we normally get. In fact, I think most of our poster prizes were worn, were won um, this year by uh, people coming from outside um, the United States and Canada. And the second thing was that it really did give us a boost in membership, which we hadn't seen. So, um, so of course, we're not going to do this year. This this next year, we're going to require we're going to have a registration fee for everybody. But um, it was an interesting it was an interesting experiment. Thanks. Looking for other individuals who have something important to share. Well, Liz, maybe if you could put the panelists up since I don't see any hands raised right now, we can see if any of the facet panel individuals have any final comments they'd like to offer before we turn it over to Michael to close. So I can uh, I can say something, Jamie, if you don't mind. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank please. you. You're right after me. Um, I would just say that you know we're in a fantastically dynamic and changing environment related to conferences, and pulling together uh, groups like we've done today and like we did with our panel to create sort of a a thought document that doesn't give an answers to all of our questions, but sort of helps frame the questions is a really useful activity. I wanna thank AIP for doing it. I think the most important thing I've taken away from the process is that uh, we have to be creative. We have to listen to lot, the people that we're trying to serve and we need to be flexible. But at the same time, we actually have to make it work financially at the end of the day. And that means that perceptions have to be managed. Communications have to be clear to our participants about what's happening. And we need to explore partnerships and new ways of doing what we've always done. And that's hard. It's really hard to do all those things, but it's something that we can all rise to. And I'm really excited about the outcome of this report and the great conversations that we've had uh, today. Jamie? Yeah, I, uh, I want to say thank you for welcoming an outsider to the, uh, to the world of science being an outsider. But uh, the thing that I, I, I I heard that maybe I want to reinforce this, this idea of simplicity. And, you know, it can get very complicated really quickly as you think about hybrid and going back. And the thing that jumped out at me was the remembering the conversations of four and the small conversations and the power that that has. And it's such an easy thing to design and to execute in your societies. And people get such rich information and relationships from that. And uh, the behavioral science around people should be front and center as you go and design these, these events. We are all, your members are people and there is science around how they want to behave and engage and research it and use it and use the diversity of thought that's available to you and bring in outsiders to ask the provocative questions and you'll be surprised. I think this panel is a great example of how diverse thinking can lead to some really great breakthroughs. So kudos to everybody and thank you. Lily? Uh, yes, I thought that this, I'm very proud of the report that this little panel put out and I really hope that, I'm, yeah, I think it's been a great day. Thank you so much for including me, AIP. Thanks for spearheading this. Lauren, do you have anything that you want to share as final reflections? Just to thank you, as others have said, I think, you know, it was a, a privilege to be a part of this group and um, to hear from everyone today. I think there was a tremendous amount of discussion um, and I'm looking forward to the report just being uh, the start of something and continued discussions and innovations around these trends. So thank you very much. Brian, I'll go to you and then I'm going to go to Amandeep for the last word from the panel but not the least important. 
Sure, I'll just thank everyone. Also, uh, the discussions were really insightful. Uh, and I'm reassured that we're not the only society with these open questions and uh, struggles moving forward. So this was really helpful. Thank you. And thank you for to uh, AIP. I just want to say, don't forget your uh, early career people. Um, as a graduate student, it is difficult to be like, oh, my voice matters, but it does. I am just a year away from being a peer to many of you. Um, so don't forget about us. And I'm really grateful that um, AIP and particularly Chris really wanted um, graduate student input. So thank you, um, FACET panelists for, you did so much work in such a short period of time. It was really amazing to see um, how quickly everyone coalesced. I think we did five meetings within eight weeks or something like that to be able to pull this report together. So thank you so, so much. And uh, to Liz and Frank and Mark also, thank you for the, the tremendous support you gave us both during our meetings, but also in between the meetings and for helping us put together this session today as well. And Michael and David, thank you to AIP for having confidence in us that we'd be able to, to produce something that, that we hope will be of value. Um, let me just repeat, we see it as a, a living document um, and one that is full of ideas, but we hope we can find maybe an interactive way to let other people add their ideas to it and we can build upon it and collect it. And I know Michael, at least in the breakouts I was in, we've heard a lot of people ask for how can this conversation consider, how can, can you, how can AIP um, do continuous kind of engagement with us so we can all learn and maybe even perhaps form those kind of partnerships that as Kevin said are hard, but actually probably are gonna be really essential for the future. So, so thank you everybody for all your insights for today. Michael, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Not clearly just for the last two hours and doing such a fabulous job hosting uh, assembly today, but more importantly for uh, your leadership role on this panel and for saying yes when I when I got in touch with you about this idea of uh, this um, crazy idea to put together this, this panel to do a, a letter report in around um, the future convening. You know, this is the second letter report from AIP um, the idea behind these letter reports is really to capture ideas from a, from a panel just as this uh, and to present those out to both our community of member and affiliate societies, but then also more broadly out to the larger both society and association community and the research community. And I think this report is, a, is an example of how much value there can be in just capturing that expertise and sharing it as a source of a sort of a spring for, for more conversation going forward. And uh, we certainly heard the, the uh, interest in, in, in continuing the conversation beyond today's assembly. And that's something which we will, we will uh, pay close attention to and, and find out uh, what the best solution is for moving forward. So really wanna thank all the panelists for all the time that you've, you've given over to AIP, just as with all of your societies, at AIP, we are both tremendously grateful for and also dependent on the, the, the brain trust that is, is the volunteer community that supports our, our mission. And so really wanna thank you for helping advancing AIP's mission, both as a, a federation of societies and also an institute that tries to push forward the, the boundaries and the progress within the physical sciences. So I really do hope we can continue to leverage the partnerships that we started today. And it's been a great um, couple of hours. Uh, it's gone very fast. Do want to pay particular thanks to the AIP team in the background who uh, were spotlighting all the speakers, keeping the slides going, getting the breakout rooms going, keeping recordings going. So really want to thank um, the whole A AIP team um, in the background and and to um, uh, the support you've given the panel and AIP. So thanks very much for joining us today. And uh, hopefully we will keep the conversation going. Uh, dig, dig deep into the report. There's a lot of ideas there that hopefully you and your volunteer communities can really uh, um, absorb and work, work on going forward. So thanks again. 
and I look forward to future assemblies and joining us at future meetings.